Hey everybody, welcome to Mammoth Interactive's YouTube channel. First of all, I want to thank you for watching this video. And remember that this channel doesn't do Patreon, instead we sell our digital courses down below. And every single dollar that we get from the products you buy below goes into making more content. The best way to help out this channel and Mammoth Interactive is to subscribe to Mammoth Interactive's huge library of content. Get thousands of hours and hundreds of courses for a low, low price down below. We have a monthly option and a yearly option. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the video. Hello everyone and welcome to our course. In this course, you're going to learn how you can build an online painting website with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. In this lecture, we're doing a project preview. So you are going to learn how to build this from scratch. We are going to build the toolbar as well as a canvas and we'll set up a server to launch our site. We are going to have different features such as adding an image from our computer and as well saving the image to our computer. And we're also going to allow for undo and redo actions such as when I draw, I can undo the drawing. We're also going to create a line tool which you can undo and redo and a square tool that is a rectangle here of any size that is both unfilled and filled. As well, we'll have the same for a circle, an unfilled or a filled circle. We will also have a eyedropper tool that will allow us to select different colors for either the stroke of a tool, such as here, this circle stroke, and a fill for filled shapes, like a filled rectangle. And Finally, we are going to as well create a text tool that will allow the user to type in some text and then add it to the canvas with that same fill color. All right, and that is the project we're going to build. This is a great template for a paint website. You could add a lot more tools and we're going to show you exactly how you can add each tool and build the functionality for that tool from scratch. You're going to learn how to work with the canvas HTML element, which allows for saving of drawings, as well as how to set up a server with HTTP server and node and a lot more. I'm excited to get started. So join me in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we're talking about what you will need to take this course. You won't need much. It's a beginner friendly course, but we'll talk about the basics that you will need. Okay. First of all, you will need some basic knowledge of some markup languages and a coding language, but we will provide for you prerequisites included in the course. So there will be a few sections at the beginning. And if you don't have any programming experience, then watch those first prerequisite sections. They'll be called the prerequisites. If you do have experience in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, then you can skip the three prerequisite sections that we've included because we are going to teach you a bit of the basics of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript before we jump into this course. As well, you are going to need a code editor to follow along with the coding. Now, code editors are free. You can either install one to your computer or you can use an online code editor, a website to code right along. Now I'm going to be using brackets, which is very common for web development, web design, but you can also use jsbin.com. That's a website where you can just follow right along without downloading or installing anything. There's also CodePen, another website. There's Atom. You could download the Atom editor. That one's very popular. Visual Studio, even any code editor. You could even use a text editor or more to follow along with the coding aspect of the course, which is almost the whole course. All right, and that's all you need. So as we said, beginner friendly. And if you do have previous experience in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, then just skip the prerequisite sections. But if you don't have experience, then watch those next prerequisite sections. I will see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we are going to set up our project of an online painting site. 
All right, so make a folder on your computer called Online Paint Project or any name you want and then open it in a code editor. Now, another option is to use an online code editor. If you'd like, you can also build your project online if you want. I'm going to be using a code editor on my computer that I've downloaded called Brackets. But you can use any code editor you wish. All right, here, let's make our first file by making a new file in the folder and we'll call this index.html. So this will be our main HTML file. Let's set up the doc type, first of all, as HTML with the doc type tag. And then let's create an HTML tag opening and closing in order to then put all of our content and specify that it's of an HTML type. Okay, then we'll have a head tag. The head tag is where you place metadata and links to anything that you want loaded before your body is loaded. So in our case, that's going to be a CSS sheet, first of all, so our styling. Let's put in a link. The type is a style sheet and the reference is going to be style.css. The type is going to be text slash CSS. All right, then let's create that file. So because we called it style.css as the hyperlink reference, that means it must be in the same folder as the HTML file and it must be called style.css, our style sheet. So I will right click and I'll create style.css. This is where we'll write any styling that we want for our website elements. Now back in index.html, let's keep going. I also want to specify the character set. So that's metadata. Metadata you also put into the head tag. And there are lots of types of metadata. The one that we need to use is UTF-8, which typically you should specify in every HTML file because you're specifying the character set of your file. Okay, that's all we need for now for the head tag. And next up, let's open the body tags, opening and closing. The body tag is where we place the content that will actually be on the body of the page. And, and we're going to have several items here. We're going to have a toolbar as well as a canvas where the user can upload an image and then draw on the image, etc. Now we're going to add all of that coming up. In this lecture, we're just doing setup. So one more thing for setup is we're going to reference a script. The type is going to be a module and the source will be source slash index.js and close that script tag. So this means we're going to have a folder inside of the folder where this HTML file is called source. And then index.js, that is the file name. So let's go ahead and create that folder. First, we'll have to save this, then create a new folder and call it source, and then put inside of the source folder a file that we are going to call script or index.js. That's what we already referenced it as. This will be our main JavaScript file, but we're actually going to have other JavaScript files as well with more content. Now you can see the type of the script is module meaning it can be imported and exported. And not all script types are the module type, but in our project, we're going to be using module types. And you'll see more on that when we get to the functionality part of this course. Awesome, so that is what we need for the setup here of our HTML file. In this lecture, we set up the HTML type. Then we opened up our HTML tag and our head tag. We created a CSS file for our styling and we specified the character set for met metadata. Then we opened a body tag and we referenced the script that is going to be our main entry point to all of our JavaScript, our website functionality. Awesome, now that we've set up our project, save everything and join me in the next lecture where we will continue. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture, we set up our project of a paint website. And in this lecture, we're going to start building out the first item because currently, if you open up your HTML file in any browser, then you'll just see this blank file. But we're going to start putting in our first piece of content onto the website. And we're starting off with the toolbar. The toolbar is going to be different tools that our user can use to draw, to open images, etc. And we're going to start by making the UI, the user interface 
of the toolbar. Okay, so inside of our HTML file, go to the body tag here and we're going to start creating the toolbar. First, we'll make a container for all of our content. So we'll give this div the ID of container and this is going to contain all of our elements. Okay, so it's just this default div. After that, let's make a sub div, so a child, and we'll give this div the ID of our tools container. So we could use tools underscore container here and make sure you close off that tag as well. Okay, this is going to be the div that contains our tools. So let's start putting in one tool. I am going to create a button because the tool has to be clickable. So because the HTML is where we're writing our user interface, with HTML, you want to be specific about what a tag is. So if you're creating something that can be clicked on, that is often going to be a button rather than just a div. Okay, so we have this button and let's give it an ID immediately. We'll call this our open file button. Okay, so an ID can only be used one time per element. If you want to use an ID twice, it's better to make it a class instead of an ID. And this will allow us to reference this button by its ID in JavaScript and then be able to perform some action when this specific button is clicked. So when this button is clicked, we're going to allow the user to open a file from their computer. So open an image and then put it onto the canvas. All right, so this is the button. Now currently, if we open up our file and refresh, look at that, all we have is this empty button object. And we have this empty button object because we have a button type on our website. Now let's say what if we want to actually give this button some content. Well, in that case, we can place text inside of the button tags right here. So in between the opening button tag and the closing button tag, we could put an icon, an emoji, we could use just text such as open. And then if we save this file and refresh our page, look at that, now our button says open. Right now, if I click on this button, nothing happens except this visual effect of the button's color changing. But later on in this course, we're going to enable this button to work and whenever it's clicked on, we'll allow our user to open a file and put it onto the canvas. All right, but for now, let's just start with the UI. So I'm going to start by making a whole bunch of buttons for all the tools we're going to create. And then we can change them into icons. So a visual icon instead of just text will look nicer. Okay, but let's start by putting in all the tools. Currently, we have an open file button. Let's make another button. We're going to give it an ID. Again, this time it will be save file button. And this save file button, this should have the text save, which later will change to an icon. But for now, we can just leave it as the text save. Great, so we have open, then we have save. Let's keep on going here. Let's put in another button back in our HTML. I'm going to make another button and this will have the ID of undo button. So this will allow the user to undo some action. And the text of the button will be undo. Similarly, we're going to have the button redo button and this will allow the user to redo some action. Now, of course, there are a lot of different paint tools you could have. I'm going to stick with the most fundamental paint tools. And of course, you could expand this project even further and add more tools. But we're going to have quite a few tools regardless. Let's put in another button with the ID of freehand draw button. And this will be the button that will let the user draw with a brush. And we'll call this our draw button. Then after that, let's make another button item. Again, we'll give it an ID and we're going to do line buttons. So this will allow our user to create a line and the text of it can be line. Then after that, we will create a button with the ID of rectangle button, which will allow the user to draw a rectangle. Then we're going to have a filled rectangle. So I'll make a button with an ID of filled rectangle button and its text will be filled rectangle. Don't worry, we'll replace it with icons shortly. 
and we'll have another ID for circle button, which will allow the user to draw a circle on the screen on their canvas. And finally, let's put in a filled circle. Okay, so these are just some sample tools that you can have. Of course, you could put in more tools if you wanted to. Let's save this for now and refresh our page. And look at this. Now we have more buttons on our page and each button represents some action that the user can perform, such as drawing or opening an image. Now, currently you can see these are all side by side, but I want to put them on the left hand side. So if I want to change the appearance of my web page or positions or colors of items on the page, that's what I need my CSS for. That's what our style.css file is for here. All right, so what I will do is I'm going to put all of my items to be, instead of being side by side, they should be on top of each other. So they should be vertically positioned. For that, I'm going to grab every button by calling its tag button. And this will grab every single button on the page and it's going to apply whatever style I want to that button. The style I want is the display style and the display I want to change to block. The default display for a button is inline, but I want to change it to a block, which means it will be treated as its own unit that should be on its own line. So now if I refresh my page, look at this. I have all of my tools and this time they're all vertically stacked instead of horizontally. And because I changed the display from inline to display block, which treats each item as taking up its own line. All right, and I can preview this in 100% zoom and we can see it looks like this. So quite small on 100% zoom. That's why I'm just zooming in here for you to see. But typically it's best to preview on 100% zoom. That way you have the most realistic view of your items. All right, great. So. We have all of our items here and what we can do is apply a lot more styling to it. All right. So we could change the font size. We could change colors. We can add icons. There really is quite a lot you can do depending on what you want, you want your website to look like. We're going to continue with that in the next lecture. Hello everyone. And welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture, we put in several buttons, one button for each tool in our app. Now here, next up, we are going to replace the text in the buttons with icons because that's going to look a lot more appealing. Okay. And luckily for us, there's actually a free icon library. So everyone go over to this website known as icons.getbootstrap.com. Okay, Bootstrap is a library for styling. So it helps you style your website. And Bootstrap has a sub library of icons. All right. So you don't actually need to include or install Bootstrap before you use its icon library. You can actually just use the icon library without using Bootstrap. And so go over to icons.getbootstrap.com. And if you scroll down here, and you click on install, then you're going to see the various ways that you can install these icons. Now it's very easy and the icons are free, copyright free as well. So all you have to do is go to the CDN section. A CDN means you can load in content such as a library like Bootstrap or a sub library like its icons. You can include them via a link. So all you have to do is click on this clipboard to copy the link to the CDN and then jump right back into your HTML. Okay. And open up your index.html file and scroll up to the top inside of the head tag. This is where you include any content that you want to be loaded before your body. So first we're loading our styles and we're also specifying the character set. We're also going to now paste in what was copied to our clipboard over from bootstrap icons. You'll notice here, this is a link tag and the type is a style sheet, just like CSS because bootstrap is for styling. It provides quick styling rather than tedious CSS styling, which you will have to use CSS styling as well, 
to you know fine tune styling and if you don't want to use bootstrap but if you're building a more complex project and you want quick styling then bootstrap is useful for our project here we're not going to need bootstrap but we're going to need bootstrap icons okay so here we can see the hyperlink reference is a URL and this URL is that library of bootstrap icons and it's a CSS file and this will allow us to include icons inside of our HTML file and they'll be automatically created for us. Now you can use any icons you want, of course, but bootstrap icons are really convenient. If you go back to the website icons.getbootstrap.com and if you scroll up here, you can see all of the icons, okay? So there are quite a lot of icons and they all look good. Bootstrap is very commonly used for all sorts of websites, big and small. Bootstrap is very popular, okay? And if you go to the very top of the site and then just scroll down a little bit here for icons, you can filter and look for icons you want, such as a pencil icon or a brush icon, for example. All right, so you can filter and find exactly the icon you want. All right, so now we know how we can include these icons in our HTML file. We can just do it with that link. And just by including that link inside of our HTML, we can instantly use the icons. So how do we actually replace the text in our buttons with an icon instead? Well, that is what I'll show you now. All right, so scroll down to your first button. This button is an open file button. So that is the button that is going to allow the user to open an image and put it onto their canvas. All right, so instead of using this open text, we're going to replace it with an I tag, which stands for icon, and the class is BI image. All right, now BI image, this is a class that stands for bootstrap icon of an image. All right, this is not a class that I'm going to style with CSS, but this is a pre-made class by bootstrap. And the only reason I can use bootstrap icon image, BI image, is because I included bootstrap icons in my head tag. So if you go to the bootstrap website, icons.getbootstrap.com, and then you search for an image, you'll have all of these bootstrap icons that are for images. In our case, we're using this one of an image, right? So if I want to use this icon, all I have to do is go to the usage and that's right here. You can copy this I class BI BI icon. In our case, we only need to use BI image. So you copy whatever name the icon has preceded by BI and a hyphen. All right. So if I wanted to use a different icon, I would just replace this image and I'll show you all the different ones we're going to use. So now if I save this file and I open my HTML file, look at that. Now, instead of having open as my button text, I have an icon. Awesome. So let's do that for all the other buttons as well. Our next button is the save file button. And for that, I'm going to open up an icon. Then the class is going to be BI save. Okay, I found all of these earlier for us, but if you want, you can look through the whole library of bootstrap icons. You can look through them all and find more icons, okay? But I found some that we can use for our project. All right, so for the save, the save icon is called BI save. And if I refresh my page now, look at that. We have this save file icon. Next up, we have the undo button. And for that, I'm going to open up another icon. The class will be BI arrow counterclockwise. Make sure you close that icon tag as well. Save the file, then refresh and look at that. Now we have a nice arrow counterclockwise icon. Let's fill in the next button, which is going to be the redo button. I'm going to open another icon tag. The class is going to be bootstrap icon arrow clockwise this time. All right. And if I refresh my page, look at that. Now I have that redo icon. Let's continue with the draw button. Okay. For draw, I am going to use a pencil icon. So I'm going to open up an I class 
equals bi pencil. And now if I save the file and refresh, I have a pencil icon right there. Next up, we have a line. Now for the line, I'm going to do an icon from Bootstrap of a dash. So I'll do an i class equals bi dash. I'll save the file and refresh, and now I have that line. Next up, we have a rectangle. Okay, for a rectangle, I'm going to use the bootstrap icon class of bi square. And if I save that and refresh, okay, I typed in something wrong clearly, so I have to go back. Ah, yes, I have an equal sign instead of a hyphen, so that's why it didn't give me that bootstrap icon that I wanted. But if I fix that, then look at that. There you go, it shows up. Then let's do the filled rectangle. So for that, I'm going to put in an I tag. The class is going to be bi square fill. I'm going to save this and refresh and I have a filled rectangle. And finally, the last two are going to be a circle and a filled circle. So let's create the first one. bi circle is the bootstrap icon class. If I refresh, I see that circle. And finally, our last button is going to be a filled circle. So I'm going to make an icon tag with the class of bi circle fill. And I'll close that. Then when I refresh, awesome. Okay, now I have my toolbar with icons instead of text, and that looks a lot better. Great, all right, next up. Now that we have our toolbar set up, there is more styling we could do. We could change the background color of each button. We could change the background color of the toolbar and much, much more. And we could also put in more tools as well. But for now, let's leave the toolbar like this and move on to the next step, which is going to be to draw a canvas. So join me in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture, we learned how to include bootstrap icons for our toolbar. And in this lecture, we're going to put in our next item, which is going to be a canvas where the user can draw, they can add an image and more. All right, let's get started. We're going to jump back into our HTML file here inside of our code editor. And we're going to put another item into the div of our container, which contains all of our items. All right, so for that, let's go into our that div just before it closes. We're going to make another div and we'll give this the div ID of our let's say canvas container. All right. And then inside of that, we're going to have a canvas. Okay. The canvas is a specific HTML tag that is perfect for drawing, adding images, and then being, being able to save that. We're going to give this canvas the ID of our drawing canvas, and then we can close off that canvas. For a canvas item, you have to set its width and height properties immediately in the HTML. So I'm going to set the width to 950 and the height to 950, that's in pixels. Then if I save this and refresh, well, by default, you won't be able to see it, but you can give it a background color in your HTML, or you can also give it a border. Let's give it a border. So we can do that in our style.css and we're going to grab the canvas item. We can grab it with either its HTML tag or its ID, and then we can set its border. All right, so I'm going to give our canvas a border of, let's say five pixels solid black. All right, so this means the border will be five pixels in width. It will be a solid border, not a dashed or a dotted, and the color of the border will be black. So then if I refresh, look at that, here is my canvas. All right, and if I zoom out to 100%, I'll see what it looks like here. So our canvas has been placed by default below our toolbar, and that's because the toolbar is a block item, and so is the canvas, it's a block item. But I can put the canvas right beside the toolbar next. Okay, so for that, I'm going to have to set the position type of all of my content. So I'm going to go back into my CSS file and I'm going to set the position type of my toolbar and also of my canvas container. All right, so I'm going to start with the toolbar. 
if you go to your HTML, you can see the tag and the ID of the toolbar, which is our tools container. So we'll copy that ID and we'll reference it in our CSS with a hashtag followed by the ID name. That's how you reference an ID. Then we're going to set the position to absolute, all right? This means that instead of being relative to other items, the default, the position is going to be absolute, meaning wherever we place it, it will be there regardless of other items. It won't be affected by other items. And now if I refresh my page, well, look at this. Now I can see my toolbar and my canvas are overlapping, all right? And that's exactly what I wanted here. All right, now if we're at 100%, we can see our toolbar is really small. So I have to increase the size of my toolbar content. Otherwise, if the website loads, and by default, it will load at 100% zoom typically, if your user has that as their settings, which most users do, well, we need to increase the size of that toolbar next up. All right, so for that, I'm going to set the font size of my buttons. Let's jump back into our editor and we can grab the buttons and we can set their font size to something like five rem. Okay, meaning this is going to be five times the default font size. So now if I refresh, look at that. My icons are a lot bigger. Now they're a little too big, so I'm just going to make them a little bit smaller. Let's say three rem and refresh. Okay, great. So now we have our toolbar and it's a lot easier to see at 100% zoom, which is exactly what I wanted. Next, we will also notice the toolbar is overlapping the canvas a little too much now. So we have to move the canvas to the side. So for that, I'm going to go back into my online paint project. Now, because our tools container position is absolute, it means it's going to be placed anywhere we want, regardless of other items. It won't be affected by other items in the layout. And I'm going to do the exact same for my canvas. I could do it for my canvas or I could just do it for my canvas container. So we can grab the canvas container, which canvas underscore container is the exact ID. We can check that as well. If you scroll down in your HTML, there it is. Canvas container, that's the div that contains our canvas. So make sure that you reference it exactly with the same capitalization and underscores and spelling. We're going to reference that ID of canvas container and we're going to set its position to absolute as well. Okay, now if we save this file and refresh, not much of a change, right? But in fact, it has now been placed on top of the toolbar and that's because it's now no longer affected by any other items. It's not in the layout either. And that means we can also shift it over to the left. So we're going to set its left property to 85 pixels. This is going to take the canvas container and move it, move its starting left position 85 pixels from the default, which is zero. You see, by default, if you place an item of position absolute, that means that item is going to be taken out of the layout and it's going to be placed by default at the top left hand corner, zero, zero. But if I change it to 85 pixels and refresh, look at that now, my item has been placed by default at zero, at 85 comma zero rather because I didn't change the top value, it's still placed zero in terms of the top of the page, but it's now been shoved 85 pixels to the from the left, okay? And I can increase that just a little bit more. It looks like 85 pixels isn't quite enough. So let's change that to 90, all right? And you can use a different value as well, depending on how it looks in your browser. Okay, so let's see, here we have 90, still a little too small, so I'm just going to increase it to 95. Now, typically with CSS, you want to do all the fine tuning at the end and you want to make sure your website looks good on all browsers and all screen sizes. But typically you do all of that at the very end because otherwise you could spend so much time moving items around and styling them when you haven't even finished the whole layout. So typically you want to do your final styling at the very end, but we can just do our initial styling now. Okay, take a look now. We have our toolbar and we have a canvas that's been outlined, all right? Now, currently, if I click on my buttons where I move my canvas or try to, nothing happens, right? So we've set up the HTML, which is the content, and the CSS, which is the styling. And next up, we have to add 
another element to our website, and that is the JavaScript. So that's the functionality behind our buttons and behind our drawing, our saving, etc. And that is what we'll work on coming up. We're going to continue this project and start setting up the JavaScript. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture, we learned how to build this canvas item on our site. And in this lecture, we're starting a new section where we're going to learn how we can build the JavaScript. So we're going to start with the main JavaScript files for the project, the starting point of the JavaScript. The JavaScript is the functionality behind the site. So we have the basic user interface. We have a toolbar, we have a canvas. Now we actually have to build the functionality. So the drawing, the lines, the rectangles, the uploading, the saving, all of that is functionality. So for that, let's jump back into our code editor here. We have our index.html and we can see we have a script reference to our source folder in the same folder as the HTML file. And then this file index.js, this refers to our entry point for the JavaScript, which is this empty file called index.js of the JavaScript type. This is where we'll start in index.js with writing our functionality. Our first step that we're going to do is we're going to add an event listener to the window. Okay, so if you have a code editor, often you'll have these hints that tell you what functions mean that are quite useful. So here, the window refers to the window of our website and add event listener. This is a function that's going to listen for some event such as clicking or scrolling or loading, etc. There are lots of events and you can find all of them just by using a search engine and searching for all events if you're interested. We're going to learn a lot about events in this course. Let's start with one event known as load. Okay, this means that we can perform some action when our window has loaded, okay? When the whole page has loaded, we can perform some action, okay? And the action we put into a function that takes in some event, and then we open curly brackets to specify the function body, so what we want to happen. And then the parentheses closes off the parentheses of the event listener. And we add a semicolon. Although semicolons are not required in JavaScript, they're good practice because they make your code easier to read. Okay, great. So what do we want to happen when our window has loaded? Well, we want to instantiate a new app object. So I am going to make a variable with the keyword let. This will create a variable that's only accessible within its scope. I'm going to call this my main app and I'm going to instantiate a new app object. Now this app refers to a class that I'm going to create shortly. Okay. And this is going to be the starting point for our app. Now, in order to create a new app object, I'm going to make a new app class. So let's go back to our source folder. Let's right click and create a new file that we'll call app.js. Okay, this is another blank JS file, right? And we're going to separate our JavaScript into different files, okay, because that's best practice. Here in app.js, We've already started to create a new app instance. So for that, we have to make a class called app and that will allow us to make new app objects. So inside of app.js, create a new default class app and then use curly brackets to open the class body. As well, put an export keyword in front of the default class keywords. This means we can export it and use it in other files. All right. Then we create a constructor with the keyword constructor, two parentheses, and then curly brackets for the constructor body. This constructor is what allows you to make a new app object. And then we can specify what we want to happen for each time the app is created. In our case, we're going to load all the functionality. Okay, 
So this constructor allows you to make new objects from the app class. Now inside of index.js, there's one more thing we need and we have to import the app if we want to actually use it. So because we were able to export the app in the app file, we can now import the app and use it here in index.js. For that, we use the keyword import and we import the class name, which is app, make sure it's a capital A as per convention. And because that's also what we called the class with the capital A. And then we're importing it from a certain location. In this case, well, where is this file? This file is inside of the same folder as index.js. So in JavaScript, we use a dot slash app.js. This is slightly different from HTML. In this case, we're using a dot slash to signify that we are inside the same folder instead of just using app.js. All right, so to recap, first we added an event listener to run code only when our window has loaded. And then we created a new app instance by making a new class and making it exportable. And then we imported it into the file where we wanted to use it. And that's how we were able to create a new app object. Great, okay, next up, now that we have set up this app constructor to make new app objects, every time the window is loaded, we'll make a new app object, which is akin to refreshing the page and reloading the functionality. And our next step is going to be to continue here and to start working on the functionality. All right, so we're going to have a lot of different pieces of functionality in our app, starting with our functionality of loading an image. Okay, that's going to be the first thing we'll work on because it's the first thing at the top of our toolbar here. So join me in the next lecture where we will continue the project. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In the previous lecture, we set up our main JavaScript files, index.js and also app.js. Next up, we are going to create some more JavaScript files and those are going to be for our model, our tools and our controls. Okay, and those are all that we're going to need and they'll be working together. All right, so we are going to get started here inside of app.js, all right? We are done with index.js here, where we have instantiated a new app every time the window loads or reloads. Okay, then inside of app.js, here is where we're going to create a new model, tools and also controls. We'll start with our model. So let's create a new variable called model and we'll instantiate a new model object. Now, similarly to how we created an app object, we need to create a model object by making a class for it, exporting the class, and then importing the class into this file. So first step, let's go to our source folder and let's make a new file that we will call model.js. Then here inside of model.js, we'll have a lot of functionality, but we'll just start off with making the class. So I'm going to export the default class model. I'm exporting it so that way I can import it into another module if I want to use it. All right, then I'll set up the constructor as well. And we're going to put content later on more of it, but let's just leave it now here with an empty constructor. Great, okay, so now we have this class and we're exporting it in the file of model.js, which means we can import it into the file app.js. So let's go to app.js and then let's import it. At the top of our file, we'll import our model class from the same folder, which is dot slash, meaning the parent folder of the current file. And then we are going to go to the file model.js. That way we can now use the model class, okay? Otherwise, we would not be able to access the model class because we're working with modules. Okay, great, so we have a model and the model we're going to use for our controls. 
our controls we're going to need a model and also tools and we'll fill them out later on you'll see exactly what each of the files do we're just setting them up for now okay next up we need tools so let's make another variable called tools and we'll make a new tools object now again we have to create a file inside of the source folder we'll make a new file called tools.js so you're seeing the pattern now tools.js here we're going to make a new class make sure you have export so you can export it for use in other modules and we'll set up the constructor okay make sure you spell constructor correctly okay so again we're setting up a constructor and we'll fill it out later okay so we have this constructor that will allow us to make new tool objects we can save that now and we can import this class into app dot js so at the top of our file here we're going to import tools the class from this parent folder and the file tools dot js one more object that i need is going to be my controls so i'm going to make a variable called controls and i'm going to instantiate a new controls object okay then inside of my source folder I'm going to make a new file called controls.js and again we'll fill out more of this later but let's just set it up for now our final file that we'll create for the project starting off it's going to be an exported default class so make sure you can export it and we'll call it controls okay then inside of the constructor we'll just leave it as an empty constructor but we'll have a function called init for initialization and we're going to put in a model and tools so we're going to require a model and tools every time we instantiate controls with the init function and we'll assign this dot model to equal model and this dot tools to equal tools so we're assigning the classes variable model to equal the model argument that's passed in and we're assigning the classes tools variable this dot tools to equal the tools argument that is passed in Great, okay, so now inside of app.js, let's reference the class. We have to import it, so we have to import controls from the parent folder with dot slash and then the file controls.js. And make sure to save that. And what we can now do is we can initialize the tools, the model, and the controls okay currently we have the function in it in our controls so we can call controls dot in it and you see here we're required to put in a model and a view so our model is going to be our model and our view is going to be our tools okay great and as well let's create the init functions for our model and our tools as well Okay, we can start with the model. For that, we'll jump into our model.js file. We have a constructor. Yes, we can leave that and we can make the init function. And every time we want to make a new model object, we're going to pass in the controls. Okay, so we'll assign this.controls to equal the controls argument passed in. Okay, so then inside of app.js, we can call init on the model variable so we can grab model dot in it and here we're required to put in in this case we are only required to put in the controls because that's what we specified in our class model dot js in our function in it we only needed to put in the controls Okay, and finally, we'll have one more init function for our tools. So let's go to tools.js where we have a constructor. And we can also make an init function here as well. So every time we initialize or call the init function, we'll pass in controls again because these three are working together. And we'll assign this.controls to equal the controls argument passed in. That way, our model, our tools, and our controls, they can all work together because they're all sharing these common arguments passed in. Now, inside of app.js, one more thing we're going to do is call now tools.init, and we are going to pass in the controls. 
Awesome. Okay, so now we have this set up where we have three different classes, model, tools, and controls, and they can all work together now because we have connected them via these arguments. This will make a lot more sense later on when we are going to actually put them to use. Now I'm also just going to move the controller.init to be after the models and tools have been called just because that way we'll make sure the model and the tools are all set up before we have controls, but really it doesn't make too much difference. All right, make sure to save everything. Don't forget, always save frequently. And next up, join me in the next lecture where we're going to continue the project and start adding our first piece of functionality. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course. In this lecture, we're going to learn how we can enable one of the buttons in our toolbar. Starting from the top, we are going to enable this button that will allow the user to open an image from their computer and then later we'll load it onto the canvas, okay? All right, let's jump into our code and get started. We're going to get started in our file tools.js, okay? here we're going to start with one tool, and that is going to be the opening of a file. The first step is going to be inside of this init function, we have to create a listener that listens for the click of a button, specifically the open image button, and then responds accordingly. So inside of index.html, here you can scroll down to our body and we see we have this button. This button, it has the ID of open file button, and that is how we can reference this specific button for opening a file. Let's copy that ID to make sure we don't make any spelling mistakes, and then go back to tools.js, all right? And here in tools.js, we're going to write our listener. So first we're going to grab that button with document.querySelector. And the query selector function allows us to choose an element from our HTML and we can reference an element by its ID with hashtag the ID. You can also reference elements by their class as well, but we're going to work with ID here because an ID is unique to one element only. Okay, then after that, now that we have grabbed the button, we can then add an event listener to it with dot add event listener. And just to make this easier to read, I'm going to first save it. So I'll save this as a variable that I'm going to call my open button. And then I am going to grab that open button and then add it and add event listener. So this function is going to listen for events on some element. in our case, the open button. And we have to specify the event we're listening for. In this case, we're listening for the click. And then we are going to grab some event that happens. I'm going to call this event. And then we open up a callback function for what we want to perform when the button is clicked. Okay, right here. And we can put whatever we want to happen inside of this function body. So just as a test, we can call console.log and we can say open button was clicked just to make sure that this event listener is working properly. So let's save our files, make sure everything is saved and then let's open up our browser again and refresh. And this time we're also going to open up the developer tools. So I'm going to go view developer, developer tools. And okay, here we have the console. Now, we're going to get this cross origin access issue. And that's because we have to use a server to use module JavaScript files. So in order to get our scripts working, we have to launch a server. Okay, so for that, I am going to just close this console and open up my terminal. Okay, the terminal, also known as the command line, will allow us to launch a server and therefore we won't have that cores issue. Okay, so here I am in the terminal. I'm going to zoom in just so you can read. And we're going to use the HTTP server to launch our site. Now you can use any server that you'd like, any server launching system like Node or HTTP server. And 
to use HTTP server, first you make sure you have it installed and you can install it via node. And then you can just call it with HTTP dash server. Okay. Followed by the path of your project folder. So copy the path name of your project folder and then paste that in. So this has to be users slash your username slash the folder where you have your project. In my case, I have it in this online paint project folder, then hit enter and you'll get this message starting up HTTP server serving your project. Now, if you get an error message, that means you probably have to install HTTP server first and you can install it right here via the terminal as well. So now you have this HTTP server available for you to use at any of these two links. And these will be hosting our site now. So instead of running locally, our site is now running on this link. So I can copy this link and then in my browser, instead of visiting my project folder to visit index.html, I'm going to paste in that link. Okay. And here we go. We have the same website, but we're now at this different URL. And now if I open up my developer tools, which you can also use a keyboard shortcut to do that. There we go. Okay. Then we get a different message here. We now get failed to load resource. The server responded with a status of 404. Okay. So let's just refresh this a few times and okay, there we go. So that was just because it was still kicking up. But now look at this. Now we are successfully reaching our website with no errors about not being able to access JavaScript modules. So we have to launch our website on a server because we're using JavaScript modules. So inside of our project, I'll show you, we have index.html. And if we scroll down, we have this script that we're referencing via a module. The type is module and the source is index.js and then index.js itself, it uses other files. And because of that, because we're using files across different origins, we're not just putting the script into directly just a script type with not a module. Because of that, we have to launch a server in order to access our website now. And you often have to do that for many, many projects. So it's important to know how to launch a server. Okay, great. So this is our console on the right hand side now. And now if I click on my button, look at this, I get this console log that says open button was clicked. Awesome. That is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to test that this button was indeed logging something to the console because that means that I am successfully referencing that button in my file of tools.js. Okay, great. So we've added an event listener to our button. Currently it's just console.logging that the button was clicked, but what I'm going to do next is I'm actually going to write the functionality that is going to allow me to grab a file from the user's computer. And then I'll be able to put that file onto my canvas. Let's continue with that in the next lecture. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this course. If you want to watch the rest of the course, the link is down below. Not only will you get the access to this course, but you'll get access to a lot of other courses in a huge bundle. And it's on sale today. So buy it before the sale ends. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.